Hey y'all, happy Sunday and welcome to this week's live Q&A session. This is the portion of the show where we allow YouTube to send out notifications that we're going live. If you're watching this live Q&A on replay, please scrub ahead until this graphic disappears and the actual show begins. If you're watching live and you have any comments or questions, please go ahead and put them in the live chat. But for now, grab a beverage, sit back, and relax while the countdown timer does its thing. Then we'll get started. Hey y'all, happy Easter, uh, happy Sunday, man, it's been a week, and I tell you what, I have got lots of questions going on here and in the comments. Uh, thank you everybody for the comments, 
thank you for uh, the uh, show suggestions and everything else. I really do appreciate it. Uh, this is what keeps me going with this channel. Um, today was an introduction. I get questions every week, uh, the top two topics, machine bed versus material surface and tiling tool pass. Tiling tool pass is coming. It's in line and it's moving up the list, getting here real soon. Today was the introduction to the difference between the material surface and the machine bed. And um, as I said, it was just an introduction. The next video in two weeks, I'm going to dig a lot deeper into um, the two and I'm going to rerun both files and we'll dig in and see what's going on. Before we get started, I uh, wanted to give a shout out and say a hello and good morning and happy Easter. Well, good afternoon now to my buddy Steve with Harneal Media, who sponsors my website at marklindsaycnc.com. There's a link to my website in the description, and there's a link to Harneal Media in the description of every video on my channel. And if you are even considering a website, uh, there is no better way to develop or increase a web presence than with a website. And uh, Steve is the first guy I would talk to. Uh, he knows his stuff. He knows what he's doing. The man is everywhere. I don't think he ever sleeps. Um, and he's competitively priced. And when you deal with Harneal Media, you deal with Steve, not somebody you will never speak to again. You're dealing with Steve every time. So thank you for what you do, Steve. And I'm proud to call him a friend. So uh, let's see what we have going on here. We have several questions. But uh, I'm going to start in the channel comments. Um, basically because we had some good comments here um let's see colorado work with woodworking i haven't seen you in the chat i don't know if you are here and i believe that is steve i may be wrong i may be wrong on there but his uh comment was i zero to the bed 99 percent of the time i mostly build furniture furniture pieces and cabinets and it's the only way to guarantee outside diameter dimensions regardless of the material thickness there's a reason pro shops do this for 3d carves like you said material is good if you don't care about minor dimensional differences then stick with whatever system you usually employ but he brings up a very good point here in that touch plates are repeatable to within two to five thousandths now that is true to a point it it depends upon your software and your machine as well. Uh, it, now, Mach 4, they claim plus or minus half a thou uh, tolerance. And I'm not sure what that is. Um, let's see. Uh, let's see what that is. That is point that that is a tenth of a millimeter well actually closer to one eighth of a millimeter they claim that is their repeatability the avid cnc the repeatability because it is rack and pinion the repeatability is one thou so you add those two together and then you put uh a two thousandths tolerance on your touch plate well you're at three and a half thou there so th these variables can add up and pile up on one another 
which brings me to another point that was brought up in the comments by um, John Sautier. And this kind of dovetails in with uh, Russell Faraday. Uh, reference zero to the machine bed, which I almost always do. Stock is on tape and CA glue, and I put two layers of tape on the bed to zero to. Keeps the spoil, but on, spoil board unmarked. Um, when I did my test piece on this piece of uh, oak veneered MDF, which was just, this was supposed to be a speaker enclosure. A buddy of mine miscut the outside dimensions and was going to throw it out. I said, nope, scrap wood. I'll use it for something. That's why I got this. Um, he was cutting out circles with a uh, jigsaw. Nyeh. And they worked out. Nyeh. I did put the uh, uh, tape and CA glue under this piece of scrap. And I put down two layers of tape and set my Z0 on that. If you look real closely at the video, you'll see that's what I did. What I didn't account for was the layer of CA glue. Now, I don't know if that made any difference because I'll be honest with you, I'm applying CA glue out of a bottle and that thickness could vary. Add to that, that com those compounded variables. Uh, let's see, Martin Pearson says, yes, but Mach 4 claim is going to be different depending on the machine. Yes, the actual touch plate, yes, and the settings that you're using, yes. And that's why I'm saying all of these variables can compound on top of one another, and you end up in a situation as described in um, John Sautier comment when he said if the machine was calibrated correctly the profile cut should have left the blue tape on the spoil board whereas it didn't it actually cut through that tape and down i mean just into in the video i said cut down to the first coat i meant the top coat just misspoke but saying the wrong word is my thing it just cut into what looks like that very top coat of sealer I put on there because I cannot feel a ridge. And my calipers came up with zero. Now I said in another comment that I went ahead and invested in a little bit better dial indicator to check this stuff out. And you can see I did. I spent the money and got the brand. Come on, camera. You can focus. Come on. You can do it if you want to. You just don't want to. Ah, well, anyway, I got the Mitotoyu. There it is, Mitotoyu dial indicator. And uh, double-checked my calibration. And it's as spot on as I'm ever going to get it. Uh, I kept getting zero readings. And I checked that spot on the spoil board, which is now covered up with stock for uh, cutting boards and it's still red zero so it just scratched the top surface of the material but the point remains that it cut through that blue tape my calibration is fine but i evidently have some repeatability issues they're less than five thousands i'm not going to complain about that it's not cutting into the spoil board like it was I'm fine with that. When I used to set my um, Z0 to the material surface for a profile cutout, I would purposely have it cut five thousandths into the spoil board just to make sure I cut through the material and wasn't leaving an onion skin that I had to cut through later on. So a five thousandths of an inch mark in my spoil board is perfectly acceptable to me. I'm fine with that. I'm going to have to dial in, dive into backlash, however. And I also have to remember that the resolution on rack and pinion machines is not as fine as a ball screw or lead screw machine. I won't say that it is the case, but it's generally 
claimed that rack and pinion machines aren't fine enough for 3D work. Now, this Barn Star is not a, uh, it's not a real fine 3D piece. Uh, it's just, you know, uh, some simple angles. I'm not carving the Mona Lisa or the Last Supper here but it's fine enough for what I do. I generally do not do a lot of 3D work. So I'm, that's why one of the reasons why I went ahead and went with the Avid was simply because I, I, that's, not, that's outside of the kind of work I do. So uh, my point in all of this is to say that there can be small repeatability issues, bit geometry, things like that, that can cause a tool path to cut deeper or shallower than it was intended to do. But setting the Z0 to the machine bed prevents things like the accident I had uh, several months back where I cut almost a quarter of an inch into the, uh, into the uh, surface of the spoil board because I forgot to remeasure a piece of material after surfacing it. In the next video, I'm going to get into combining material surface and machine bed Z0 positions in one file. And I'm going to preface that by saying, spoiler alert, this is for Vectric software titles 11.5, excuse me, 11.0 and newer. You'll not be able to do this on 10.5 and older without making two files. You'll still be able to do it. You'll just have to create two files. But I'm going to use sheets to take advantage to take advantage of sheets in the newer versions, and we'll do it all in one file. Ray Dixon, thank you very much for becoming a channel member. I appreciate it. If when the live stream is over, head over to the community tab here on my channel. You'll find a link to tomorrow's members only live stream. We go live at 530 Pacific, 830 Eastern. We have a good crowd that shows up. Some great, very talented folks. And uh, hope to see you there. Thank you for becoming a member. All right, let's see. Let's get to some of your questions here. A um, couple of off-topic questions. If anybody has any questions at all about anything in today's video or one of my previous videos, by all means, please do put it in the comments, or in the chat, rather. Uh, let's jump straight to Dan Neal. Where can we buy creativity? You can't. Seems to be as Seems to be the same as buckets of sanity none to be found it's there you just can't buy it and if you're getting your sanity in buckets you're a blessed person because mine comes in trickling streams you know <laughs> so what can i say uh you can't buy creativity you can buy somebody else's creativity if you're willing to pay the price and a lot of it's uh you know, more than worth it. But um, I, I believe that everybody has an artistic streak in them. You just haven't tapped into it yet. And that may mean anything as simple as changing a font. If you don't like, you know, I it's, it's become a joke on my channel. I use Times New Roman a lot simply because everybody has it on their computer. It comes with Windows. So there's no mystery there. And no, where did you get that font? But if you don't like a font, change it. And that's part of the creativity process. If And don't worry about, you know, the opinions of others at first. If you like it, then it's the right one. If you don't like it, change it. And, and that 
kind that kind of thing will spark the creativity now yes you do have to be concerned with other people if you're making something for someone else if you have a commission and they want this font you don't have to like it they do so then you have to pay attention but if you're creating something to hang on your wall or you're making let's go real basic one of the first projects i suggest to people is they make an address sign even if you don't hang it up out in front of your house you get a lot of instant gratification there i mean it's fairly simple just a string of numbers with a shape and possibly a background if you want one a textured background or something but that gets you in and lets you draw the size lets you draw the shape choose the font and you decide and play around with it. If you like it, you did it right. If you don't like it, change it before you cut into the material. And as Russell Faraday, I mean, that's, I couldn't put it any better. It turns up when it wants to. Never found it when I'm searching for it. And I'll agree. I'll agree right there 100%. You know, uh, something I try to tell, especially people who are brand new at this, is trust your eye and trust your judgment. You, it's easier to identify what you don't like than it is to identify what you like. So kind of keep that in mind in the, in the back there if you don't like something it's going to stand out to you and you're just going to oh no no thanks at all so just keep working with it and keep practicing and pretty soon it'll start getting easier and easier and easier i'm a recovering real estate agent and when i was showing houses to prospective buyers i would tell them straight out okay you've told me some basic criteria on what you're looking for what don't you like what don't you want because that's easier to narrow down if they tell me i don't want a two-story house well that just eliminated half of the list right there and that saved us all a lot of time if you're thinking about a a design and you don't want triangle shapes perfect if you don't want any sharp angles perfect you've just eliminated several possibilities and you're on your way to narrowing down that design i want an old west type font perfect you've you keep narrowing things down in that regard it's easier to identify what you don't want than it is what you do want so kind of keep that in the back of your brain and you know it'll uh it, it'll it'll get easier um and you won't even realize it's happening let's see here um Dwayne Ruthig says I agree with your analysis on the tape and glue the glue depending upon the lines you squeeze out and if you smooth it or not could make 10 thou difference yeah that's what I was thinking myself uh set your caliber at ten thousandths and look through the crack and see how small that really is just saying yeah ten thousandths is uh you know it, it may not seem like much but it is especially if you're off that much <laughs> uh colorado work woodworking there you are keep in mind that conductive z probes have their own tolerances add machine delay to stop the motor inertia etc once the switch closes all add to a few thousands of repeatability error yeah we just went through we just went through that and they compound one another and next thing you know you've got five six seven eight thousands of error and it will happen you know uh it, it it's learning to manage and figure out some of that error and eliminate as much of it as possible so 
Uh, Bob Health Bridal says, I don't know how many projects I've designed in Aspire that I have never cut, but I call it practices. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, I'm in the same boat, Bob. I have, oh, hundreds of files that I have never cut and probably never will. But I was trying to figure out a certain problem or a certain process, and that helped me along the way, you know. And um, I, I just like to get into the software and draw with it. It That's the only way you'll get used to it and become good at it. Um, I tell people, and it's the same no matter what you're trying to do, that there is no replacement for experience. And the only way to get that experience is to do it. So, you know, it, it, everything digital can be deleted or fixed. So you're only out the amount of time it took you to do whatever it is you're doing. And I don't watch TV anyway, so I just put it in, uh, yeah, put in the hours in the evening. And much like you, Bob, there's a lot of things I will never do. It's just I did it because I wanted to know how to do it. And that's helped me on other projects. So let's see here. Uh, Robert Dymock wants to know, uh, do you work with or have you used panel clamps? Now, in a box, you can't see it. It's pretty well hidden. Uh, you can just barely see some green right there. I have a Fulton panel clamp system the uh, panel press system. And I have not mounted it yet because I've got stuff in the way of where it's going to be mounted. This is a wall mounted clamp system that uses, uh, mine uses three clamps and you glue up the panel pieces, drop them into the clamps, it hangs vertically off the wall and they all clamp down and it clamps four ways. I have not yet mounted it simply because I've got to get the dust collector and uh, uh, compressor out of here first, which means, yes, building my lean-to. And I've changed it. I'm not going to build it out the back. I'm going to build it out the side. So I've got to get started on that as soon as it decides to quit raining, basically. So I have one. I have not used it yet. Um, and I'll... Let's see. I'll put a link to the system I have down in the description of this video as soon as I'm done. So um, hope that answers your question. I, I, I don't have any kind of brand loyalty as it sits right now. Um, I know a few people like the Clampzilla system. I thought that was extremely expensive um this was no slouch but it was about half the price um i don't know there are so many systems out there it's not even funny um i am doing a lot more glue ups than i used to i don't know if that's good bad or indifferent but um i finally decided that using uh two four six eight pipe clamps was getting a little bit uh, too cumbersome. And so I invested in this. I have yet to mount it. We'll see what happens when I do get it done. Okay, uh, let's see here. Um, okay, Dwayne Ruthig says, good thoughts on creativity, Mark. If you narrow out the negatives, don't like, You'll have much more freedom for the positives, do likes, and be happier with the end result. Yeah, I I agree. I agree. And uh, Jay Scotia is right here too. You need to do some market research because sometimes what you don't like, they do. That is also true. But again, that comes down to you're making something for somebody else. I, I I'm prefacing this by saying if you're making something for you, let your creativity flow. If you're making for some, if you're making something for somebody else, there's a, there are a lot of very varying factors involved in there. 
you know, uh, if you're making a bottle opener that's got to be held in your hand, making it 10 inches in diameter is obviously the wrong answer, unless it's a joke or something meant to be hanging up on the wall. But so, you, yeah, there is a little bit of research to be done. But if you're going to batch out a hundred of something, you're going to appeal to you hopefully are going to appeal to 100 people that want that item. If you're doing something custom, that's when creativity has to enter into it. Because I can make all of the three-handled bottle openers I want, but if nobody's interested in them, I'm going to have a whole bunch of three-handled bottle openers that nobody wants. So yeah, you do need to do some research. But... I'm talking about stylistically speaking, if you like it, then go with it. If you're doing something for yourself, it's just like picking out colors. If you want bright red walls, paint bright red walls. If you want blue walls, don't buy bright red paint. You know? Colorado Woodworking here says, I use shop projects and gifts to let the creative juices flow. Exactly. Exactly. So. Uh, let's see here. Uh, Chris Noor wants to know, what is the easiest, best way to get smooth curves? For example... I would have tight curves and cornering. Vectric has lots of points. Seems like each point the CNC hesitates just enough to leave a mark to sand. Okay, that could be the Vectric software. It could be the settings on your control software. But let's assume that it's the Vectric software. Let me bring up, um, let me import something into Aspire here real quick before I share with you. Um, and I will do, okay, we'll do that one here. And, um, I love dead air. It's importing a file and I've got nothing to say until it gets finished doing this. Okay, here we go. Now I will share my screen with you here. All right. Let's take a look at this file right here, Chris. Um, I've got this spiral tornado design, which is available for free at my website. Uh, link in the description below. It's in the shop. Go to CNC files, and it's you'll see it in the free file section. I used this in one of the V carving for absolute beginner series. I think it was. I don't remember if it was part two or part three, but one of these. Uh, one of those two videos. Uh, and what I have is a DXF file that I imported, all this geometry here. So if I select it all, and I come down here under Edit Objects to the third row, third icon over, I have Curve Fit. Okay? Now, let me um, just, I'm not going to go into Curve Fit just yet. But I've got this all selected. Let me tap N on my keyboard to go into node editing. And look at all the points. Look at all the nodes. And you're absolutely right, Chris, in that each one of these points is a reference. This was drawn up in a CAD software, not in Vectric. Each one of these points is a reference that bit may or may not stop at every one of these points. But all of these curves, what this is telling me is all of these curves are made up of straight line segments. But they're so close together that when you step back and look at it, they look like curves. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to select all of those vectors and I'm going to come over to that icon curve fit I'm going to click on it and it's going to show me how many points are in the pattern right now now I can fit curves to these vectors in three ways I can go with a circular arc 
I can go with Bezier curves and I can use straight lines. Well, I don't want to use straight lines because it already is straight lines. So the first thing I'm going to try is it's already marked. I'm going to go with circular arcs. Then I'm going to click preview. And you see how many points that reduced. Now, the a circular arc is a segment of an imaginary circle that has a known diameter or a known radius. And that's perfectly fine as far as it goes. But when you get into a situation like this here, you have a very tiny radius and then another small radius and then another radius here. That may be acceptable to you. But let's see if we can reduce that even further. And let's try Bezier curves. And I'll preview it using Bezier curves. That reduced it even more. It tightened up a little bit in here, but overall there were fewer points in this pattern than before I started. So I'm going to go ahead and accept Bezier curves for my pattern here. And that dramatically reduced the number of points in this, uh, in this uh, design. Now, I want to make sure I keep sharp corners and equally important, maybe more important, but equally important at least is you want to check, replace the selected vectors. If you don't have a check mark here, what it's going to do is it's going to make a copy of the vectors right on top of the old vectors you're trying to smooth out then you're going to have a mess on your hands. So by doing this, it's going to get rid of the original design and put this over it, uh, in its place rather. So we'll click OK. Now if I go into node editing, it looks confusing, but that's because these are now Bezier curves and all of these are control handles. But we still have a lot fewer points than we did and the resulting cuts, the resulting toolpath will be all the smoother for it. Okay. So that's the easiest way to do it is before you ever calculate toolpaths, while you're still over here in the drawing stage, select the vectors, in this case, all of them. Select the vectors and come over here under edit objects, third row, third icon fit curves to selected vectors and that's the secret right there so i hope that answers that chris it takes a little bit of practice and it takes a little bit of memory you know it, it it's it because it's not something that you would think about especially if you're just in a hurry and you try to get going and get it outside and start cutting. But then when you're spending a few hours sanding, then you go, man, there's got to be a better way. Yep. Okay. AJ, is it Terramana? I'm having a lot of trouble with my materials cupping after I surface them. The struggle is real, my friend. I meter the material and it reads zero moisture. Is there anything I can do to reduce cupping? Very little. Very little. Um, the one true fact of life, and this is, this can be, oh, uh, Russ, uh, thank you. I'll get right back to you in just a second. Uh, Russell Faraday brought a, uh, brought a good point here, and I forgot to mention this, Chris. Um, let me go back here, uh, to share, get back in here. Boom. Okay. Let's get back into this. I forgot to mention this and thank you for bringing it up. If you look, these are all separate vectors. This design is not grouped. I can click on individual vectors. 
if I group them, come over here and group, now it's one group. It's treated as an object, okay? If I select it and I come into curve fit, click on, uh, let's go with straight lines just for giggles. Preview. Well, it is going to do it. Is it going to do it? It did do it, even though they were grouped. Oh, it ungrouped them automatically. That's why. Okay. It grouped them automatically. Uh, it ungrouped them automatically. Um, uh, Russell, which, uh, which, um, version of the software do you have because this ungrouped automatically let me control z to undo that they're still ungrouped control z okay we're back to the group edit okay so it ungrouped them automatically when i uh did the curve fit okay that's interesting i didn't know that it would do that uh, depending upon which version you have, it may not do that. So if you have something grouped like this, ungroup it first. So, okay. Um, back to the other question. Uh, talking about material cupping, that's just a fact of life. And there is little to nothing that can be done about it, uh, no matter what the uh, moisture is, content is and what your moisture meter reads, um, which is why so many people glue up panels and alternate grain patterns. Now, there's still a lot of controversy about alternating grain patterns. Some people, you know, uh, you have the, uh, especially on flat sun materials, you have the uh, cup, the, 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 growth rings in an above uh, overhead arc going arching this way, and then the next strip arching down, then arching up. There's still some controversy as to whether or not that works. What I have discovered is if I'm going to be machining away a lot of material, uh, doing a lot of surfacing, um, and I'm using a flat sawn piece, I make sure those growth rings are curving upwards because if i'm removing a lot of material it's less likely i'm going to try to do this with my hands it's less likely to warp, warp upwards like this than it is if i flip it over it's really easy for it to warp like that if that makes any sense let me see. Do I have a real thin? Yes, I do have a real thin. Uh, come here, boy. Uh, I have a real thin piece of maple here. If your growth rings are curved up like that, um, it's less likely to cup in this direction. Now, uh, Colorado Woodworker has a good point here. Building furniture, the best advice I can give is to keep widths to seven inches or less. I personally ignore grain direction and acclimate wood to your shop. Um, how long do you acclimate your materials? I was taught uh, one week. Let it sit for at least a week. Now, um, I... I I was also taught six inches wide, max. If it's more than six inches wide, you should cut into strips. And so each piece is less likely to cup individually. But seven inches, okay, that's fine. Um, okay, uh, and you acclimate yours two to three weeks. Okay, I was taught a minimum of a week. And um, now all bets are off on sheet goods. This is for solid stock only. Sheet goods tend to be more dimensionally stable. But um, the 
main thing is it's always going to move. And that's where we get into a discussion I have with machinists a lot when they get into um, resolution. And that is that wood moves always long after the tree is dead and a, a memory. It's always going to move. It's going to change with humidity, temperature. Um, you know, if you don't believe that cut a pocket in a piece of wood and hang it in the sunlight, then measure that pocket after a couple of hours. Just that heating up alone is going to change it. And you're right. If you surface a piece of material and even leave it on the spoil board, go in the house and come out the next morning, it's moved, it's changed. And there's nothing you can do about it other than try to take some preventative measurements, uh, measures. And there are a lot of people, a, a lot of good suggestions here. Um, uh, it'll also help, help reduce cupping if you take some material off of both sides. That is true. Um, uh, maybe surface both sides and don't lay it on its side. Let the side breathe, let both sides breathe equally. Yes. Um, stickers on the floor and then lay it flat that'll help it won't be the cure but it'll help um let's see take a heat gun to the other side of the cup and heat it it will take out some but not all i've also seen people take an iron depending upon how thick it is i've seen people lay down a cloth and then take an iron to it and that'll help take out some of the cup but then again you're only delaying the inevitable. Um, okay, thank you. I'm carving a Purple Heart guitar body out of a solid piece. Challenging. Uh, I know a friend down in Nevada who did one back in the late 90s. And I don't have a picture of it on this um, computer. But I took a picture of it in 2012, and it's still just as purple as the day he carved it. And the secret is you have got to seal it 100% against air. And he did the typical, it's a Stratocaster copy body that he made out of a solid purple heart. And he built up several layers of lacquer, and it's just as purple as the day he first carved into it. So you have to seal it from air if you want it to stay purple. Um, but yeah, it, it it's a glorious thing. I'm here to tell you a glorious thing. About all I can say is um, I, I not knowing what kind of body you're making or how, you know, uh, your belly cutouts and your uh, tail cut out and everything else, uh, all your carving or are you doing arch top or anything like that uh, try to get those growth rings going upwards for the front and that will help it, it's harder to cup in the opposite direction nature wants it to move is what i'm getting at you know so let's see uh ray dixon says if it's raining or humidity is high i use wood hardener on both sides to stop cupping that'll work for some softwoods i don't know about hardwoods i i really don't i've never used a wood hardener for that purpose um, i tend to use uh, wood hardeners or conditioners on softwoods mainly as a prep for finishing because it helps avoid that modeled appearance when you like if you stain pine or fur or something like that you'll get a real uneven finish because of the resin pockets and stuff inside the wood but <clears throat> but the struggle is real and um but you can overcome it believe me uh let's see ray dixon our newest member says i will be drawing an aspire and when I run the simulation, the wood type and color will change on its own. Okay, let me let me go in there. And this is something I keep forgetting to do. Okay, so let me go in. Oh, Telecaster, that's gonna look sweet. That's gonna look sweet. 
Um, let's see here. God, you shouldn't have told me that because now I got a Purple Heart Telecaster on my mind. Uh, <laughs> okay, um, Ray, in your uh, job setup, get down here into material settings. This is where you set up the default for that, for this file. And I keep forgetting to set mine on medium wood. Now, here's the thing. You get that set up and you click OK. And now your 3D view is going to be medium wood. It looks like this when you have nothing on it. If you don't have a 3D model, that's how it's going to look. But if I, OK, here you go. Let's take this still grouped, still grouped. All right, perfect. And let's V carve this to a flat depth of 0.125. And I'll use a 60 degree V bit and an eighth inch uh, clearance tool. And we'll calculate it. Yada, 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 and it jumps into the preview screen. My material is medium wood. Now, if I need to change this for some reason, I want to go back to Canadian maple or something like that, I can click this button right here with the palette, the artist palette on it, and I can change the material here. Well, I don't want to change the material. Now, if I just save G code and I don't save this file, it's not going to save this change. OK, so the next time I open up Aspire, uh, let's open up a new file and create a new file. And I go into material settings, it's Mahogany V because I didn't save that other setup. So close that, bring this one back up, and I'll just save it to my desktop. And I will, no, I'll put it over there. I'll just call it Tornado. Save. Okay. Close this, go back over here. Whoops. Undraw those tool paths. And come back over here like so. Now I can close this. Now open up a new session of Aspire. Create new file. And it should remember the settings I had. It didn't. Hmm. For some reason, it didn't remember the settings. Well, then, hmm. that's odd. Hmm. It should remember. <laughs> yeah, let's wait. There we go. OK. Now let's say file, save as, I'll call it Tornado 2. Saved. Now, again, it should remember my material setup as being for medium wood. Let me close it. Now, let me right click. Let's open up my original tornado. And let's see what happens. All right, kept all of the tool paths. And can't tell there. Let's go over here, undraw the tool paths. And let's look in the preview. Yeah, okay, it saved that there. Hmm, okay. Well, anyway. Uh, you have to get in, Ray. Um, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> you have to get in as part of your material setup, your job setup here, and go into your material settings. This used to be 
on its own, it had a little section where you had a pop-up button. Why they put it behind this window, I don't know. But now you have to pop that, uh, click that material settings button, and then choose your setting from there. So, okay, let's see here. Uh, let's take that away. Ray says, I also have problems keeping the mouse controls working properly. If I want to move the simulation or draw drawing around, it will work great. Other times it will change to zooming in. Ah, um, there are two parts to that. Let me go back here. And I need to start reading the questions before I decide to stop sharing the screen. <laughs> All right, here we go. Uh, I assume you're talking about the 3D view. Let's go ahead and uh, let's change this to black toolpath color so you can see it. And we'll change this to black so you can see it. Then we'll preview all toolpaths, let it do its thing. And there we go. So I bring my mouse cursor in here and I'm using the scroll wheel to zoom in and out. This may or may not have been a good pattern to do this with. Sorry if I'm bringing up flashbacks to anybody. If you press down on the left mouse button, you're going to just move around the piece. If you hold down control and press the mouse button, you're going to move the piece. Or if you scroll in and out with the scroll wheel on your mouse, you'll zoom in and out. If you press down on that scroll wheel, you'll move it around. That's probably what you are doing or not doing, Ray. If you're trying to zoom in and you hold down that mouse button, you're moving it around. So there are a couple of different ways of doing it so you don't confuse yourself. Not everybody has a scroll wheel that is also a button. Sometimes the scroll wheel doesn't push down. You may need a new mouse. It may be that button in there, the micro switch on that button is just dirty, or maybe you just need to clean your mouse. But if you press down on that scroll wheel, you're moving the uh, material around. If you press down on the left mouse button, you're rotating the piece. If you hold down control and press the left mouse button, you're moving it around as well. If you right click, you're zooming, moving side to side or up and down. So there's various ways of doing the same thing. And again, sorry if I'm freaking anybody out with this pattern. This probably wasn't the best pattern in the world to demonstrate this with. <laughs> so uh let's see in mach 4 it's both mouse buttons to move the image yeah and there is there's i don't know there's i find some inconsistencies depending upon which program you're using in some programs i find uh pressing the right mouse button brings up a context menu as you would expect but when you're working with images here, sometimes pressing the right mouse button is how you move something around. Whereas in, in this program, it's how you zoom. Um, and other, you press one and you're rotating like this. Uh, it, there's some inconsistencies. Just like I know that um, 
in most Windows programs, if you want to select multiple objects one at a time, you have a list of uh, files, let's say, and you want to select one at a time, maybe you have a list of five and you want to select three of them. You'll select first one, hold down control, select the second one, hold, uh, keep holding control and select the third one. And that selects them individually. Other programs, you hold down shift. Like Vectric, if I, let's reset that, close it, come back over here to 2D view. If I tap U to ungroup and I select that vector, if I want to select this one too, I have to hold down shift. You know, um, whereas other programs, I would hold down control to select individual things. So there is some inconsistency back and forth there. Uh, Brooks Martin says, sometimes a dirty mouse pad has weird effects on an optical mouse. That is true. But I find that if you, now I'm sitting here, I'm still sharing. Uh, but I find that if you blow out the scroll wheel hole, uh, a lot of times on an optical mouse, that will clear out any dust or schmutz or whatever's in there. So uh, Dustin Norris, thank you very much for the super chat. I really appreciate it very, very much. I hope you're getting some value out of this chaos. <laughs> uh, Sargon brings up an interesting point. Most new optical mouse don't need a mouse pad. I find that to be true. However, I prefer to have a, a nice soft mouse pad to run it across rather than my desktop, which may or may not have like uh, soda spills or coffee spills or something like that all over it. And um, the mouse pad is a nice um, matte or flat uh, colored surface that's non-reflective what it's like to be me, Sargon. You, this is more than you wanted to know. I'm standing back over here by the machine and I look over at this computer and I can see a red light flashing on the bottom of my monitor. And I'm like, uh oh, what the heck is that? And I come around here. I could not find what was flashing. It was driving me up a tree, but it's a red light. I finally got in just the right position and looked down and it was the it was the low voltage laser inside the mouse. See how that's flashing? That's what it was doing. I couldn't see it in the mouse, but I could see the reflection of it on the monitor and it was driving me crazy. Once I found that, moved it out of the way, all was fine. So, <laughs> so yeah. All right, let's see here. Well, we're a little bit over an hour in. Uh, Dan, Dan Neal says, much appreciated the size discussion into creativity. Thanks. Well, as I said, it's it's you have more creativity than you give yourself credit for. Um, and, but if we don't if if we don't work with it and experiment with it, and you'll hear me use the word play a lot. Because that's what I think it is. It's playing. You know, this uh, spiral tornado that I've been using to demonstrate, I just, uh, it's a uh, public domain design. Nobody really owns this design. And I saw it in a, what did I see it in? I saw it in something. I don't remember what it was. And I just, traced it, uh, got an image, imported an image into, uh, I imported it into vCarve, then exported it as a DXF file, then loaded it into my CAD software, did a little bit of editing and playing around with it, then re-exported re as another DXF. And that's the one that I give away on my website free in the shop. There's a few files in there for free. 
and that this is one of them. But I didn't come up with the design. I didn't come up with the pattern. I just saw something that I liked, and I said, can I draw that? And so I did. And there are a bunch more, believe me. You can get into optical illusions. You can get into old books on um, various designs. Gosh, I'm trying to remember the name of the book that I have. It's an old architecture book. I'll look for it. Um, and if I can find it, I'll put a link to it. Uh, it'll be uh, online free PDF. I can't even remember the title of it, but it has all kinds of designs, everything from how to draw a simple floor to lay to doing, uh, I mean, huge panels with a whole bunch of different swoops. And I mean, oh, just, man, man. So um, just uh, get in and find things and play with them. Something else that I do is I, I love old machine drawings, old technical drawings. You can find, for instance, I found a expired patent image from the 1800s of an old table saw. And I think those are cooler than heck. So, um, I, I found a couple of photos and I traced them. I think there's a fantastic, I want to get a pen mount for my CNC. I want to make one and draw one up and hang it on the back wall back there. I mean, you never know where inspiration is going to come from. You know, it, it, if you want to learn how to draw animals, draw animals. I mean, you're going to get better. You, you're not going to succeed your first time up at bat. Believe me, it's very rare that you're going to get what you want the first time you try it. But each time you do try it, you will get better. And you won't even realize that it's happening. And just have fun with it. Get in it and play. So. Okay, um, let's see. Ray Dixon says, I am pressing down on the scroll wheel, works sometimes and not other times. I have five mices, but same problem with all. This problem started three software generations ago. I'd shoot, a, uh, shoot an email to Vectric. If this started three software generations ago, I'd shoot an email to them, especially if it's doing it with five different mice. There may need to be a uh, there may need to be a, a plug-in developed or something like that. Or maybe you've got something on your computer, an update or something like that that's interfering with it. But I would definitely shoot a, an email to Vectric if this has been going on for three, gener three software generations with five different mice. So, okay. Uh, let's go ahead and wrap this up. It's been well over an hour. Um, next week will be an open Q and A. So if you didn't get your question answered today, I apologize. Um, save it for next week and I'm sure you'll come up with some good ones. You always do. Um, so next week will be an open Q and A. Um, members, including our newest member, Ray Dixon. Remember, check the community tab on my uh, YouTube channel for the link to tomorrow evening's members only live stream. Uh, we're going to finally dig into the uh, bowl and tray bit debacle and uh, see if we can't get that all sorted out. 5.30 Pacific, 8.30 Eastern. If you don't know what we're talking about, if you'd like some information on how to become a channel member so you can partake of the members only live streams. And I got to tell you, it's a lot of fun. These people keep me jumping, but there's some real creative folks that are members. We have a lot of fun. Click that join button down there below this video panel next to the subscribe button there. And a little panel will pop up and a video will play that will tell you all about channel membership. I do hope to see you uh, 
over there. If you choose not to become a channel member, please know I do appreciate you watching the videos, spending some time with me on Sundays, especially on a day like today. It's an Easter Sunday holiday. I hope you spent some quality time with friends and family and uh, hope you have a great, great rest of your Easter Sunday. Thank you, everybody. And um, trying to remember, is that all I wanted to say? That's all I wanted to say. I will find the uh, link to the my panel clamps and to that design book, and I will link them both in the description. So until next week, yep, y'all take care. Have a great rest of your Easter Sunday, folks.